welcome you to uh, this session of the Sperry Symposium. We're going to hear from Avram R. Shannon and Joshua Sears. Their presentation is Let Me Take Another Wife, Israelite, Jewish, and Latter-day Saint Polygamy in Historical and Literary Perspective. I'm going to introduce them and turn the time over to them. Avram R. Shannon is assistant professor, an assistant professor in the Department of Ancient Scripture at Brigham Young University. Dr. Shannon received a PhD from the Ohio State University in Near Eastern Languages and Cultures and studies early Judaism. He and his wife, Thora, are raising seven children here in Provo, Utah. Joshua Sears grew up in Southern California and served in the Chile Osorno Mission. He received a, a BA in Ancient Near Eastern Studies from BYU, where he taught at the Missionary Training Center and volunteered as an EMT. He received an MA from The Ohio State University and a PhD in Hebrew Bible at the University of Texas at Austin, where his dissertation focused on Jewish polygamy during the time of the New Testament. His other research interests include Israelite prophecy, marriage and families in the ancient world, and the publication history of Latter-day Saint scripture. He has presented at regional and national meetings of the Society of Biblical Literature, BYU Education Week, the Sidney B. Sperry Symposium, and the Leonardo Museum Conference on the Dead Sea Scrolls. His wife, Alice, is from Hong Kong and plays in Bells at Temple Square. They live in Linden, Utah with their five children. All right. Yeah, we're going to be talking about polygamy tonight. We're going to go through Bible times, both Old Testament, New Testament, and Jewish history beyond that, and we're going to arrive at Latter-day Saints. Our hope tonight is to be able to compare and contrast and give some broader context to the, the practice of plural marriage, both anciently and modern. Before we get back to the Bible, though, there's one idea that we want to start with that can be so simple that it's easy to overlook, and that's basically the idea that how you think about polygamy in large part derives from your culture. There's a lot of cultural influence on how you think about it, um, if you're gonna do it, how you do it, <laughs> and all those kind of things. If you wanna start with these cultural um, kinds of attitudes. Um, the United States is a Western country, so to speak, and in Western cultures, po polygamy today is frowned upon, and there's legal prohibitions against it in a lot of places. So when you're used to that, and polygamy can seem very strange and foreign and even feel like something that was only practiced in the past. Well, the reality is that for most of Earth's history, most cultures have been very accepting of polygamy, and it surprises some people to know how much polygamy there still is going on in the world today. So um, just on this whole idea of culture here, I don't know how many of you remember that classic movie from 1959, Ben-Hur, with Charlton Heston right there. There's um, a funny sort of scene here where, that kind of illustrates this. You've got Charlton Heston playing a Jew, Ben-Hur, and he's in a tent eating dinner with this um, Arabian sheik right there. And they're having this conversation where... Uh, the sheik says, I hope next time you come back that you'll bring your wives with you. And Charlton Heston makes this response here. He says, oh, I don't have any wives. And then the sheik responds, no wives at all. I have six. No, seven, he goes. <laughs> and then Ben-Hur responds, someday I hope to have one. And then the sheik says, one wife, one God that I can understand, but one wife, that is not civilized. <laughs> Right there. And of course, even in the, the movie that this is a joke, right? But it's meant to illustrate this fact that it all depends on your perspective. What are you, in fact, used to? So then moving on here, in the 90s, they performed this ethnographic survey and found that they split up the entire planet in about 1,200 societies and found that 85% of them still allow for polygamy. And of course, that doesn't mean in these societies that the majority of people are practicing it. It might be very small, but there is some allowance made for polygamy in the majority of these societies. And then a couple years ago, the Pew Research Center came out with some stats suggesting that up to 2% of the population of this planet lives in polygamous households. Uh, that's as a husband, a uh, wife, or a child right there. And you can see it does, uh, the percentages vary by region. So you can see polygamy is still most prevalent in the Middle East um, and especially in Africa. And you can see the percentages there. This is the number of people in households that are polygamous households that you see right there. Um, and if you look at some of these African countries, you can see that um, in some cases, more than a third of the population lives in polygamous households in some kind of role, um, including in a couple of them, about a quarter of the Christian population 
So that right there suggests, again, that this is not uh, necessarily a religious divide you're seeing here. This is very much culture. Depending on what region you're living in and all of that determines how accepting you are of this and how likely you are to do it. So we want to think, keep culture in mind um, as we're getting into the Bible here, just that, that idea that culture is going to have a lot to do with how you approach this. So when we get to the Bible, we want to start with what's their cultural background, what are the Israelites understanding um, from the get-go right there. Why don't we switch places so I can um, All right. signal for that. So we're going to start talking about, again, to understand what's going on in, with polygamy in the New Testament, in Second Temple Judaism, beyond, we really got to start with the Old Testament. And this is why in the Old Testament, we have to start with the ancient Near East. Because the Old Testament is a text that is heavily embedded in the broader ancient Near East. So as we look through, and we, we find as we look at ancient examples of polygamy, ancient examples of how the ancients, that we find about four sort of categories we find polygamy. The first and most prevalent is kingship. Ancient kings, ancient kings were trying to be the biggest dog. And so um, this was a way of having more wives of showing how big a dog they were. And so what we find is that one of the most common places we see multiple wives in um, the ancient world is with kings. Kings are going to be, again, that sort of central place for that. Another common place where we see it is actually in the places where there are issues of infertility. So if a man has one wife and then um, that wife is infertile or he's infertile, they're infertile together, then the man will take another wife in order to still have children. Okay? We also find examples where there are marriages of slaves, where a man will marry one of his slaves as part of his wives. That's another common example for that. And because we have all these examples, we find examples of it throughout law codes. There's lots of legislation in the ancient world describing when and where and how you dealt with uh, multiple wives. This is here, this is from... Um, Hammurabi's code um, there with that. So as we turn from the broader Near East into the Bible, we find similar things happening, right? You look, the most, you know, the, the biggest sort of example of this is, so here's King Solomon, okay? It's, it's a portrait of him there. We, uh, no, we don't know that, but here's King Solomon. King Solomon, of course, is famous for the multiplicity of wives, as you know, the Bible tells us about 300 wives and 700 concubines, okay? Once again, it's about being on top. So uh, many of our examples of polygamy in the, scripture, in the Bible, David, Solomon, we have Saul, have multiple wives, okay? We also find examples in the Bible where we have, um, um, because of infertility, right? This is famously, this is the example of Abraham with Sarah, where uh, her slave Hagar um, is given to Abraham as a wife because of Abraham and Sarah's infertility. Connected to that, of course, is also the fact of, as we see outside, this notion of marrying slaves. Hagar is Sarah's slave. In a couple of generations from Abraham with um, Father Jacob, you have um, Zilpah and Bilhah who are um, also slaves who um, marry and are part of Jacob's wives and are therefore part of the establishment of the house of Israel as it's described in the book of Genesis. The other thing we have as an antiquity with laws, we also find because of that, the laws in the Bible will legislate about polygamy. They are very concerned with, again, the law in general is very concerned with how you do proper relationships, and so it will govern and um, legislate about these relationships. And we're going to look at a couple examples here to kind of get a sense for what those look like in the Bible. Okay, so they're kind of, we, we've put up sort of three main law codes in the Bible. There, there are other places for this, the covenant code, the holiness code. So basically Exodus, Leviticus, and Deuteronomy are the places where we, so all places in the Bible we find law, we find legislation about what you do when you have multiple wives. 
So, for example, in Exodus, there's a law there that protects the right of a slave wife if the husband marries a wife. So it's the, the idea here is that even though the wife comes from a lower social status, she still has legal protection under the law. Okay? Leviticus, um, there's a whole section there about the right kinds of, who you can and can't marry, and who, what kinds of relationships are there. You can't marry a wife and a daughter, uh, you, you can't marry a mother and a daughter. You also can't marry two sisters simultaneously, okay, according um, to Leviticus. Okay, Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy has this um, thing about where if you have more than one wife, and as at least the texts tell us, you favor one wife over another, then you can't give more inheritance to the kids you like best or the wife you like best. It protects the inheritance of the children born to the husband's less favored wife. And so, again, these are the kind of laws here. And one of the more intriguing examples of this, so there's an imagery we find in the Old Testament broadly about this idea that it understands the covenant that God makes with Israel as a marriage covenant. And then when Israel is worshipped other gods, they are being unfaithful to that marriage covenant. In some places in the prophet, especially Jeremiah and Ezekiel, we see examples where the prophets talk about both the northern kingdom of Israel and the southern kingdom of Judah, both as Jehovah's wives. And that both go astray. And the ancient Israelites, again, living in a society that where polygamy is just an understood thing, would see the, the, the image of not just one wife cheating on you by worshiping other gods, but both wives cheating on God and breaking the covenant by worshiping other gods. And so this imagery makes its way into the prophets. But mostly what we see as we read and look at the Bible, look at the Old Testament, is the way that polygamy is explained and understood and worked through in the Old Testament is not very different from what we see in the broader Near East. In fact, it is well within continuity. There are little places here and there we see things, but it's well within continuity with how polygamy is understood broadly in the ancient Near East. All right, thanks. We'll go on there. So now let's move on a little bit after the Old Testament. This is the, there's a few centuries of a gap between the Old Testament and the New Testament. We call that the intertestamental period right there. So that intertestamental period on into New Testament times, uh, we're going to just run the history up through there. Uh, we find examples of Jews continuing to practice polygamy throughout this period there. The most famous example on the left there is King Herod, you know, the baby killer King Herod that we read about at Christmas, that guy had lots of wives right there. And he's rich and powerful, and like we talked about, kings tend to do this kind of thing. But we also have some limited historical evidence of um, everyday, just kind of commoner Jews continuing to practice polygamy. So for example, um, there's a woman named Babatha. I've just, there's a picture we can imagine what she might look like there on the right. <laughs> we don't know what she looked like. But she married a husband um, named Judah who was already married to a wife named Miriam. Um, and the reason that we know about this is because in a cave in 1960, we discovered a big batch of Babatha's legal records. Um, because after the husband died, the two wives had some legal, legal squabbles over who gets what of the inheritance. I guess that's one of the complexities of these kind of relationships. So they're kind of going to court and trying to get land and things like that. And we have found her stuff there. And it's just an interesting insight into the lives of an everyday person who's not rich and not powerful, who's practicing polygamy during this period. We also have, interestingly enough, from this period, marriage contracts that have survived where the father-in-law... Well, the, the, the father of the daughter will write up the contract, and one of the stipulations is, if you marry my daughter, you cannot take a second wife later on, kind of preventing that from happening. So that keeps polygamy from happening, but the implication is, if you have to put that in the contract, the, the suggestion is, that was a possibility still, right? And apparently some people didn't like that. So... We have examples of them doing it throughout this period. It's hard to say how prevalent it was because, you know, we just don't have records for the vast majority of marriages anybody did. So you can't really say how common it was exactly, but we know that they're still doing it during this period. We also have texts where Jews are talking about polygamy, kind of in the abstract more here. 
But before we get to those, there's one big important historical development we got to understand happens in this period, and that's the coming of Greco-Roman influence. You have first the Greeks coming in with Alexander the Great, and then later the Romans coming in, where they've just got this hegemony both culturally and politically, where the Greeks and the Romans are calling the shots. So government is controlled by them. They're the dominant cultural forces now uh, where the Jews are living in Israel. And the reason that's important in this context is because in Greco-Roman society, they only allowed legal monogamy. Polygamy was not allowed. And in Greco-Roman culture, they looked down on polygamy as a barbarian practice, something that made you a backwards hick, pretty much. And you see them talking about this in their own records. So, for example, this guy Tacitus, who's, you know, tail end of the New Testament period, is talking about these, uh, um, you know, these Germans, basically, over there, and says, they're the, uh, almost the only barbarians who are content with a wife apiece. Right, praising them for being like the Romans in this way. And you find lots of references in the literature there of where they kind of trash talk people who practice polygamy. So you've just got to imagine now the Jews are kind of caught between some opposing forces here. All their neighbors to the east, polygamy is a traditional practice. It's non-controversial. That's just the thing you do. But now you've got these big um, imperial powers to your west that look down on it and make fun of you for it. So that's going to create a little bit of tension during this period where do you go with your traditional practice or what do you do about the fact that now people are looking down? So that impact there is going to drive some of the discussion in these texts. So you look at Jewish documents in this period and they reflect a wide range of attitudes about polygamy. So for example, Josephus is a famous Jewish historian from the end of the first century and he writes some histories of the Jewish people for a Greco-Roman audience to read. And one thing you find as you go through these things, he seems to be aware that when he talks about his ancestors, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and others, that when the Romans read this, they're going to think, oh man, your ancestors practice polygamy, and he might be just slightly embarrassed about this. <laughs> so one thing um, you can go through, this is part of in my research, is looking at how he uh, represents the stories of Abraham and Jacob and others. And um, I think you can see that he tweaks the stories. He can't completely get rid of the polygamy because it's too central to the plot in these stories, but he can downplay it. He can reduce the, the dramatic tension a little bit. He can kind of get rid of it where you don't absolutely need it. Stuff like that in order to make the stories a little more palatable to his Greco-Roman audience. So you see him kind of trying to navigate those cultural currents right there. Um, another interesting document you see from this period is the Damascus document. So we found copies of this at the Dead Sea Scrolls um, and elsewhere. And this is a Jewish group that takes some interesting positions one of which is they talk about um, a list of things that men are doing among other Jews that are bad, and they talk about having two wives in their lifetimes as being one of the things that is bad that Jews should not be doing. So they're against polygamy. And it's hard to say where they get this attitude from. There's different theories on that. Is it the Greco-Roman influence, or is it just a you know intra-Jewish kind of concern here? We do find other examples of Jews like Philo that equate polygamy with lust. So maybe there's a concern that men are just giving into lust, and that's why they don't like it. But they recognize that they've got to make an argument for this because it's been traditionally accepted in their culture. So interestingly enough, they pull together three scriptural examples to try to make the case here why you should not practice polygamy. They cite Genesis 1.27 about male and female is what God created, not male and female and female, I guess is what they're saying. They cite the fact that it's, everyone's going two by two into the ark. And they quote from Deuteronomy 17 that says that the king should not multiply wives to himself. So you can see them kind of trying to muster this scriptural support for their anti-polygamy position. So that's really interesting. But not all Jews are seeing it this way. You get other texts where stories about polygamy in the Bible and contemporaneously are presented pretty positively. It doesn't seem to be a concern. Uh, for example, here's an interesting one. You remember the story of uh, Samson in the book of Judges? He's got his dad, Manoah, and his, his mom, and for a long time they couldn't have kids. So in the Bible, you get, as in the picture right here, an angel shows up one day and tells her that she's going to finally uh, get pregnant and have a son, and that's where you get Samson from. So there's a Jewish text from this period that takes the Bible story and kind of expands it. It's like fan fiction here. You add a bunch of details and add to the story. And it's got this kind of dramatic conversation where Manoah is just really upset. We're never going to have kids. This is before the angel ever shows up. And he pleads to his wife, behold, the Lord has shut up your womb so that you do not bear children. Now let me take another wife so that I do not die without offspring. Um, and you see this kind of tension there. She seems to be resistant to this. And later the angel shows up, so it's okay. 
But here you get, again, this description of the fact that polygamy was seen as a way to still have children if you have problems of infertility. And the kind of dramatic nature of their conversation suggests that it was recognized that this was not without some, some tension, right, as you can imagine. Um, this was something that would have, you know, fundamentally changed the nature of the relationship, and the text just reflecting that. The, and it feels very real to me that, you know, families have a very real concern. This is a potential solution, but it comes with its own problems, and you can just, just kind of hear that coming out in these texts there. So um, looking at the New Testament, you don't find any direct mentions of polygamy in the New Testament, but there's several places where it might be kind of lurking in the background behind some of the discussions. So for example, here in 1 Timothy, it says a bishop must be the husband of one wife. Typically, this is interpreted to mean that a bishop shouldn't get divorced and then remarried, but you got to assume if that's not allowed here, then polygamy almost certainly would not be allowed as well. And there's some conversations that Jesus has, for example, with the Pharisees when they're talking about the propriety of divorce, where they don't bring up polygamy explicitly, but different scholars have made the argument that some of the polygamy conversations going around at that time, like we saw in the Damascus document, might be kind of some subtext behind the scenes based on the scriptures that Jesus quotes and how they're interpreting things, there might be, that co broader conversation just might be kind of below the surface there, informing some of what they're saying and how they're talking about it. So no explicit references in the New Testament, but might be a little bit in the background there. So in sum, during this period then, we still have some limited evidence that polygamy is still carrying on as it had in Old Testament times, both among kings and commoners. But you do see some tensions going on with this. Some Jews are hesitant about it because of the lust association. Some are hesitant about it because of the Greco-Roman influence there. Others are still cool with it. So you see kind of a wide variety of views during this period. Okay, and so as you kind of move on a little bit sort of on beyond into the very end there, you get to the Jewish documents of the rabbinic period, the, the Mishnah and the Talmud, the Midrashim. So these are Jews who are cogent legal thinkers about scripture. Their whole goal is to try. So one of the things is you read the Old Testament, is you read the law of Moses, you read actually any commandment. There's a lot of discussion on what the commandment is. There's not always a lot of discussion on how you keep the commandments. So, for example, you have something like, for example, a Sabbath day commandment, which says, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy and do no work. So, what counts as work? Can you cook food? Is that work? You can't work for money, but what counts as work? And so the purpose of sort of the sages, that's what they call themselves, or the rabbis in these texts, is to examine and say, okay, here's what the commandment says, but how do you do that? And so as they work through their inherited scripture about multiple wives, they have to ask themselves, okay, here are the commandments we have, how do you live that? What does that look like? And they are also living largely in this Greco-Roman world, and they are still grappling with a lot of those cultural things. So they'll take a scripture, for example, like here in Exodus 21, talking about a wife. If he, an Israelite, take him another wife, her food, her raiment, and her duty of marriage shall he not diminish. That phrase, duty of marriage, it actually only appears once in the Hebrew Bible, is generally interpreted as her rights to conjugal relations, i.e., if you have more than one wife, you cannot favor one by having sex with, it more off uh, with the other wife more often. You have to have sex with your wives more or less equally. That's, the, uh, that, that, that's, what, that's what Exodus says. Okay, so the rabbis say, okay, so then how often do you have to have sex? Okay, this is the kind of thing that they're, again, it doesn't say in Exodus. So they have here, concerning the frequency of sexual intercourse spoken about in the law, men of leisure, every day. A laborer, twice a week. Donkey drivers, once a week. Camel drivers, once a month. Sailors, every six months. This is according to the opinion of Rabbi Eliezer. And so you'll know here, the, the, the logic behind this law is how far they have to travel for work. I.e., if, you know, if, if, you're, if you're doing long journeys, if you're a long-haul trucker, obviously you can't visit your wife as often. Okay? And, so, and so they create this law around that. And then they actually go from here and decide that this provides a limit for how many wives they can have. 
at a certain point, they say, okay, because later on in the text, they say, sages, students of scripture, have to have sex at least once a week. And therefore, you can only have four wives. There are four Fridays in a month. You have to have sex at least once a week with your wife. Therefore, you, um, you get to have four wives, and that's the limit. Okay, again, there's a logic behind it, even though I don't necessarily agree or under, you know, with the logic for it. These okay. are the fun discussions of ancient Sunday school. You, yeah, yeah. It, it, it's, it actually, it's more like ancient high priest group, guys. Um, we still have those. Okay? So then they take up, you know, the other kind of major verse to pick up is this notion of Deuteronomy 17. And Deuteronomy 17 says the king's not allowed to make lots of wives. When we're talking about Solomon, we find that Solomon, kings actually don't do this. They do whatever they want. But the law says you can't multiply lots of wives. And so the sages say, okay, so how many wives do kings get to have? They come to the number 18, okay? Only 18. And actually, they do this through a fairly complex thing. They're like, okay, well, David had six wives, and God said twice, I'll add to you more and more. So six times three, 18 wives, okay? That's, that's their logic for um, how they do for it. But going, uh, can you go back on a slide? Okay, this idea that he shall not tell wives to himself that his heart shall not turn away. Because the sages are reading scripture. Okay, go on. And then again. So Rabbi Judah says, now wait a minute. He can multiply wives, provided they do not turn aside his heart. So Rabbi Judah says, the problem is not the polygamy. The problem is the idolatry. As long as they're not taken to idolatry, he can have as many wives as he wants. Okay, now, again, because it's like an ancient high priest group, we can't stop there. Rabbi Shimon says, even if there are only one wife who would turn away his heart, he may not marry her. And so for Rabbi Shimon, polygamy or not polygamy, the, any wife who's going to take you away is not good. And this actually, so one, Rabbi Judah says, yeah, polygamy is still okay. Rabbi Shimon says, even monogamy is a problem, guys, if it's going to lead to idolatry. Okay. Now, one of the intriguing things about reading this literature is that it doesn't always tell you the conclusion. It just gives you the conversation and leaves it right there. But the, um, the, the anonymous Mishnah helps out a little bit with trying to navigate between Rabbi Judah and Rabbi Shimon here. So they're like, okay, you've had this conversation. So why then does Deuteronomy even say? Why does it say he shall not multiply wives? And then the answer of Mishnah is, even if she shall be as Abigail. And you say, okay. So Abigail in the Bible is one of David's plural wives. And she's described as a paragon of virtue. She's, um, again, she's kind of this example of what a good plural wife is. And so Mishnah says, look, even if you have a wife as good as Abigail, so Anonymous Mishnah says is much more in line with Rabbi Shimon than is with Rabbi Judah. Rabbi Judah says, you can have multiple wives as long as they don't turn away your heart. Rabbi Shimon says, well, no, you can't. You can't even have one wife turns away your heart. The um, Anonymous Mishnah says, points to the Bible and says, even if your wife is as good as, or any of your wives are as good as Abigail, that's not enough. Therefore, do not multiply wives. And so, the sages in the end, and there's, there's a strong kind of monogamous push. They're inheriting this tense like Josephus. They're not really willing to say, we can't do this. But they kind of sort of move in that direction and say, in the end, no, the problems with polygamy are, 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 are larger than the solutions, so we're going to stick with one wife. Although, as sort of Judaism spreads after the rabbinic period, as you kind of get into the sort of post-period, uh, you find various places where Jews show up. And so what are often called the Ashkenazi Jews, the European Jews, who are largely living under Christianity, European Jews in about the 11th century say, no, no polygamy anymore. Jews only marry one wife. However, the Sephardic Jews living in North Africa and then in Spain who are living under Muslim rule, 
say, no, it's okay. You can still have multiple wives. In fact, Sephardi Judaism, on the books at least, to this day, still allow for multiple wives. They, so, so Ashkenazi Jews, Eastern European Jews, European Jews say only one wife. Sephardi Jews, in theory, say, no, it's okay to have multiple wives. Pragmatically, polygamy is no longer a moving concern in Judaism at all. Um, the state of Israel makes it illegal in 1977, and although there are still a few Jewish groups in Israel to this day who still practice polygamy, but generally speaking, it is no longer a concern in, um, in Judaism. But part of pointing out the Ashkenazi and the Sephardi is it's clear here, as at the very beginning, the acceptance of polygamy in these Jewish groups is based on their cultural backgrounds. In a Muslim culture that accepts multiple wives, Judaism says multiple wives are okay. In a um, Judaism under a Christian culture that does not, Jews say um, polygamy is not okay. Yeah, thanks. Okay. That brings us up in history now to Latter-day Saints. Um, I'm assuming most people in this room are familiar with the general Latter-day Saint history here, that Joseph Smith was commanded from revelations from God um, and through angels to take plural wives, which he did, and he taught the practice secretly to his closest associates in Nauvoo. They carried the practice to Utah, where it was publicized, and they practiced it for a few decades in the latter half of the 19th century amidst great persecution from the United States. Um, and then Wilfred Woodruff received a revelation commanding the church to stop practicing plural marriage. And then President Woodruff published the announcement of that revelation, which is now official Declaration 1 in the Doctrine and Covenants. So that's all I'll say about that history. I'm assuming most of us are familiar with that general background right there. So what I want to do now is think about Latter-day Saint polygamy in terms of what we've been talking about in the Bible. Because from the very beginning of this practice in church history, uh, members of the church have been linking our practice with the ancient polygamy among Israelites and Jews. Um, so for Joseph's revelations refer to the Bible lots of times. When Orson Pratt, is the, he's the one Brigham Young picks to publicly announce polygamy to the world for the first time um, from Salt Lake, and he continues to defend it publicly, Orson Pratt will go to the Bible and pull out passages there and use the Bible to defend the practice as Latter-day Saints are doing it. I know I've been out in discussions with the missionaries, and somebody will bring up, oh, you guys practice polygamy, didn't you? And I've heard the missionaries make the response, well, they did it in Bible times, and we do the same thing today. So we're always kind of linking this, right? We're trying to interpret what's going on in the Bible based on our practice and figure out what were we doing based on what was going on in the Bible. We use them interchangeably to shed light on one another. So what we want to suggest here is there are certainly areas of overlap where we're doing things in parallel with what they did in ancient times, but there's also going to be ways that we did things and ways that we thought of things that are going to be unique to us and things that they did and thought back in ancient times that were unique to them. So we want to be careful that we don't um, overclaim too much by drawing up the parallels between these. We want to recognize the differences that are there as well. So just as some examples of places where there is some overlap in experience. We're not trying to make a comprehensive list here, but just some, some examples here. We share our mutual experience of persecution and ridicule. Uh, you are well aware that the United States, when persecuting polygamy here, uh, it was hard, right? If you've been reading the Saints volumes, you got a fresh uh, read on that, right? And we can certainly feel some kinship with those Jews living under Greco-Roman rule who were getting made fun of for doing this and had to kind of navigate that. So that's a shared experience. There's the utility of polygamy for integrating women from outside of the community. People have noted that among Latter-day Saints, you have this diverse immigrant population coming over from Europe and elsewhere, and it was easier to bring all these people together into some cohesion in Pioneer, Utah, because polygamy allowed people to join families and made it a little easier that way. And you see some similar processes going on in ancient Israel. There's also the increased opportunities for having children especially for the husband in the relationship. Studies of Latter-day Saint polygamy suggest that on the level of the individual wife, your opportunities for bearing children go down a little bit on average in a polygamous situation, but for the husband on average, you have more children, right? And overall, there's total more children right there. And you see in ancient Israel, again, like we've talked about, infertility is an issue, and one of the common reasons for taking multiple wives is to have more kids. And so that whole... Um, Focus on wanting to bear children and raise children and have as many kids as possible is something that we could say we overlap with um, with ancient times. 
On the other hand, there's some things that are different. For example, the law of Moses says you can't marry two sisters. That's there in Leviticus, like we mentioned. Latter-day Saints pretty much just ignored that, <laughs> right? Joseph Smith marries two sisters. Lots of other people marry two sisters. So no one really cared about that. So my point here is they're not looking at the Old Testament trying to follow every little thing that it says right there. They felt free to kind of chart their own course on some things. In the modern church, there was a requirement. You always had to get permission from church leaders. And in Utah, it was the usual practice. You had to get permission from the, uh, the, the existing wives before you could enter into plural marriages. Uh, there's no indication that there was anything like that in the ancient world. There was no like church leadership that you had to go to and get permission from this. Again, it's kind of just a cultural thing. You're just getting married. So no one has to go get permission from their bishop or the high priest in ancient times to do this. It wasn't seen as like a religious thing per se. And we don't have any indication that you technically had to get permission from first wives in ancient times. We did have that story where Manoah's begging his wife to let him do it. That seems to be more, though, him just trying to avoid the, the discourse that would, or the, um, the discord that would probably naturally result if you did this against her wishes. But there doesn't seem to have ever been a legal requirement that you had to get that permission there. Finally, marrying again, even if the first wife can bear children, um, like we mentioned, often when people in the scriptures took second wives, it was because the first wife couldn't have kids, or at least they assume it's her. It might have been the guy, but that's the perception. Among Latter-day Saints, though, you could have had, had your first wife already has a whole lot of kids, and you still marry a second wife, right? So that wasn't really a concern. They're not really approaching that quite the same way. So those are just some examples of ways in which we approached it a little bit differently in how they did it. In terms of how we thought about polygamy and the framework, there's also some interesting differences that we should note here. Our one kind of canonized text from modern revelation that Joseph got is section 132. You also have Jacob's comments in the Book of Mormon as a translation of an ancient text, right? But section 132 is Joseph's big plural marriage revelation that we have canonized in the Doctrine and Covenants. And the interesting thing is section 132 mentions biblical events and characters frequently. It's very much tied to all that, but it presents them very, very differently than what you get in the Bible. And that's something that should make us go, huh, that's worth looking at. So for example, it refers to plural marriage as a principle and a doctrine where we've been suggesting that in the Bible, they saw it as a kind of a, just a cultural thing. This is what everybody does. So it's a different, very different way of framing the practice. Also, in section 132, claims twice that Isaac was a polygamist. The Bible never says that he was, right? It's just Isaac and Rebekah, that's it. So section 132 is suggesting something there you don't get from the scriptural record anywhere. It also says that God commanded Abraham to take Hagar as his second wife, um, and that's a different framing, right? You remember in Genesis, it's Sarah's idea, and she can't have kids, so she comes up with it. And like we mentioned, there's a long cultural precedent where if first wife can't have kids, she can provide a slave, her slave, for the husband to have kids there. So we can see that in the records going back way before Abraham's time. So this was just, this was a thing that you did. Whereas here, it's framed as a divine command that's the law, right? Um, another thing is, it says that Jacob did that which he was commanded to do when he took multiple wives. That's also kind of different from Genesis's presentation of this. You remember how he tries to marry Rachel and then the father-in-law swaps the brides on the wedding night so he wakes up with the wrong women and then has to work another seven years to get Rachel again. So, right, that there's no suggestion there that God is commanding any of this. It's just wedding night shenanigans there. So, but section 132 has this different take on that. Um, Prophet Nathan is said to have given David his wife, so he's in the Bible, but it says that he holds priesthood keys and sealing power in section 132. There's no hint of that in 1 and 2 Samuel. And finally, it suggests that all these guys, um, due to their faithfulness to this command, have been exalted. Now, section 132 doesn't say you have to enter into plural marriage to be exalted, to be clear, but since these individuals were commanded to do it and they were faithful to that command that they were given, that factors into their getting exalted. And again, talk of eternal marriage and sealings and keys and exaltation, that's completely absent from the Old Testament for the most part. You don't find that there. So then we're in a situation here that's kind of interesting. You have section 32 framing things very differently from what you find in the Old Testament. Um, and it doesn't, the Old Testament matches more closely what you find outside the scriptures and just the historical record in, um, in general. So that can put us in a bit of a conundrum here. How do you put these two things together, right? Where section 132 is saying all these things, but the Old Testament and everything you can tell from 
extra biblical um, records is saying other kinds of things. Um, so we've thought a lot about these kind of very different takes on this. Um, and there's probably different ways that you could try to reconcile these and different ways to work through this. So we're going to suggest one tonight as a possibility here. Uh, based on something that you find in section 84 of the Doctrine and Covenants. This is where it talks about the fact that Moses goes up on Sinai. He comes down to deliver to the children of Israel a higher law, a higher priesthood, the Melchizedek priesthood, all these things, right? But then it says the people harden their hearts. They're not spiritually ready for all that Moses is trying to give them. Therefore, it says God took the holy priesthood out of their midst and the lesser priesthood continued, which priesthood holdeth, uh, you know, ministering of angels and a preparatory gospel. So I think we're, most of us are familiar with this story right there, right? But several Latter-day prophets have looked at this story to suggest, um, not talking about plural marriage, but about other things, some of the dynamic that you see in ancient Israel. For example, um, how the, if they've got the Aaronic priesthood there, but we also have Joseph Smith and others saying that some of the prophets held the Melchizedek priesthood. Well, what's going on? And the suggestion's been made that the people in general held the lesser priesthood and are operating under that lesser law, but certain exceptional individuals, certain prophets and other leaders might have had higher knowledge, might have had a higher priesthood, might have on a case-by-case -case basis had access to more light and truth and powers and opportunities and those things. So people have used this argument to kind of make sense of other sorts of situations. We suggest something similar might be going on uh, with plural marriage. That if you take the Old Testament at face value, as well as the rest of the historical record, you could say that the Israelites in general are viewing polygamy pretty much like all their cultural neighbors do. They're doing it just like everybody else in the ancient Near Eastern does with the same frameworks and the same practices and just the same approaches right there. But you also, as section 132 suggests, might have certain exceptional individuals on a case-by-case -case basis who knew more and had access to more power and, and opportunities that way. Somebody like a Nathan, somebody like an Abraham, someone like a Moses that held the higher priesthood and maybe had additional revelation and insight about the new and everlasting covenant of marriage. So we think that might be one path where you could see, okay, I'm gonna respect the historical record and what that evidence is telling me, but I'm also gonna take very seriously what Joseph's revelation in section 132 is saying. And this might be one way of putting those together, suggesting a difference between what the general population understands and what the general population is doing and what certain prophets and leaders had access to um, based on special revelation to them. Um, that might also tie into another scripture that God, you know, said in the Doctrine and Covenants that there are certain things which were never revealed from the foundation of the world, but even babies and sucklings are going to know this in the dispensation of the fullness of times. Again, suggesting that some things we take for granted today were not well understood in ancient history. And that might be a key to understanding what's going on with plural marriage here as we understand it today versus what they did back then. Okay. So... Uh, to kind of bring this whole discussion together there, again, we suggest there's similarities and differences in how we did this um, with ancient times. When you ask, why did Latter-day Saints practice polygamy? People come up with different lists of reasons, but these are four common reasons people give. To restore all things, to give the saints an opportunity to sacrifice, to give more people the opportunity to enter into the new and everlasting covenant of marriage, and to bring children into the world. Do these match the reasons that ancient Israelites and, um, practiced polygamy? Yes and no. Again, there's overlap and difference. The first two reasons they could not have done. You can't restore a practice that's already live and alive and well. They didn't really need to sacrifice in the face of adversity because it was everybody did it. Um, number three, we've suggested they might have done on a limited basis for prophets and others that understood a bit more than the general population. Really, number four is the biggest area where, as far as reasons go, we have the most overlap. They wanted kids. We want kids. <laughs> And this was a way of having as many kids as possible. So that's one definite area of overlap. Number one, number two, not really. Number three, maybe sometimes. Okay, so again, recognizing it's okay, is our conclusion, to compare biblical and modern polygamy. There's definitely areas of overlap. There's definitely some similarities. We're not saying never compare these. We just want to respect also the fact that there were differences in how we saw things and did things and compared to how they saw things and did things. So I think we can get a more accurate picture as we keep all of those factors in mind. And so kind of as we tie this up with this and think through this, in some ways, that's an important part of our so what. As we look through and think about families today, think about families in antiquity, as we think through these things, 
recognizing that so much of what we see comes from culture and how wonderful it is that God works with us. One of the great, as you work through and think about different types and families and marriages through all the dispensations, you see how God is working with his people. Okay, Joseph Smith once said, the great Jehovah is acquainted with the situations of nations. He knows there's both the living and the dead and has made ample provision for their redemption according to their several circumstances. Brothers and sisters, I love this. We see throughout the Lord making ample provision for everybody's redemption according to their circumstances. Our families look different from families in first century and the days of Jesus. Our, those families look different from families in the days of Moses. But the Lord has made ample provision for everything because he knows who we are and because he loves us. Brothers and sisters, that's um, our testimony for this. Whatever the Lord does, whenever he teaches us, it's because he knows us, he knows you, he loves you, and is making provisions for your circumstances. I testify to that in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.